can be a reed head pheasant tail. The pheasant tail is a uh, good imitation for any of the mayfly family, but particularly the uh, pale morning done, pale evening done in the middle of the summer. That rusty, when you see it done, it'll have kind of a rusty color to it. It's fantastic for uh, uh, imitation of the mayfly, nymph, especially here locally. When you get into, once the, once the drakes start popping, you know, we're really into good mayfly season the rest of the summer. You can't go wrong with a, a pheasant tail on most of the river. There are some things that'll work better, uh, but a pheasant tail it seems like it, it'll work most of the time. Right, so we're gonna do a bead head. The first thing we've gotta do is, we've gotta figure out how to get our bead past this monstrous bar, okay? The way we do that is the barb has to go away. If you fish bead heads, you'll find that very rarely will the hook have a barb on it. And it's because you've got to crimp that barb, like John showed you last week, so that we can get the actual eye of the hook to go over it. Now, I like to, I got kind of large hands, and especially smaller flies. I like to clamp them in my vise when I get the bead on them started. And I'll always use tweezers of some kind. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the small side of the bead and put it on my hook first. I want it to end up closer to the eye. By having the large section to the back, it makes it go around that bend easier. So I'm just going to on, and I'll drop it there. And now, I'll just flip my hook around to where I want to tie with it. Most beads will work on two or three different sizes of hooks. The real determining factor is whether or not you can get the bead around the bend on the specific hook you're working on. <coughs> it's going to tie like any other fly. We're going to start right behind the bead. Bead head fly, we don't do anything in front of it whatsoever. unless. You know, there are some patterns that will have material in front. Those are a lot more specialized, and uh, you'll have to pick that up as you go. But for a standard bead head, we're going to start right behind the bead, do our four or five wraps of thread, and cut, our, cut the tag end off. Then I'll wrap back to the bend of the hook, just to get my undercoating on. Yeah, a couple things. So on a curve tip like this, where do you determine that? That, that is exactly what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> so on a curve tip, right, well on a straight, straight hook, where it quits being straight, that's the back of the hook, <laughs> right? Easy piece of If you wrap to the back of the hook where on a straight shank and let your thread hang, you'll find that it generally hangs up right about the back of the barb on most hooks. If we do the same thing on this, looks like I need maybe one more wrap there. Same thing, it's gonna be right about the back of the barb. And if you go online, you'll, you can actually find diagrams that, that uh, have a lot of hook nomenclature included, right? Like the eye, shank, bend, hook, point, uh, but also you'll find some that give some of the, the standards as far as what fly tires work from proportionally. You know, how, many, how many shank lengths should a tail be? Or you know, how, many, how tall should a wing be on a fly? Right? It all comes back to either typically the shank length or the hook gap is how we do our rough in the field measurements. So I wrap back to uh, the back of the hook, and you'll notice when this is done, it's gonna give the nymph a curved back, curved body to it. Sometimes I think the fish care, and a lot of times I think the fish don't. So our first material we're going to put in is pheasant tail. We've got to show on the camera, we've got this pheasant tail, and you'll notice 
couple things about pheasant tail is on this pheasant tail, on this side, see how all the fibers, there's, there'll be some uh, banding towards the center coming off the stem, and then I've got this nice brown, almost rough uh, feather on the outside. This is what we want to use for pheasant tail patterns. The majority of the pheasant tails you buy will have this type of filament on both sides of the wing, but if you start buying uh, entire tails, you know, which you may get 16 or 20 feathers out of, you'll find more that have this uh, stuff that is not usable to, to a lot of flight type scenarios. This could still be used as this can still be used for a lot of things, but when we talk about pheasant tail as a material, typically we're talking about this material. I'm going to take a clump of this just like we did last week with the marabou, right? And I want the tips to be lined up. Right? Remember with the marabou, John was able to tie it on, and if it wasn't quite the right length, you can pinch it off. Well, in this pattern, that won't work quite as well because we want the end fibers to really taper down to nothing. So we pull those fibers out at 90 degrees. And you'll notice they went from being, when they're natural, they go in a stacked method at the side. When I pull them out at 90 degrees, they're actually all the same length in the tips of line up. So for this size hook, I'll grab six or eight of those fibers. Just cut them off close to the stem. And then I'm going to measure, because this is, here's, let me back up on the, for our measurement. Remember, if we are doing a tail on most things, we want the tail to often be the, say, the sh same length as the shank of the hook, right? So I wrap to the back, and I'm going to put on what I want to be a split tail. The tail's going to go in two different directions predominantly on this fly. So I'm going to take my thread, and I'm going to add two or three wraps right where I stopped my thread to make a little hump. When I tie my, my tails in, it'll be much easier for them to roll to either side of that hump as I tie them in and get them to flare out. So I just put a little thread hump there, makes it split a little bit easier. I'm gonna take my fibers and measure them against the hook shank and tie them in with pinch wrap and a couple more just to keep it in place. Now two different things. One is for me proportionally looking at this once it's tied in, right? Because we're working between our fingers where we can't see. It's a little too long. So I'm going to take the whole clump and I'll just give them a little bit of tension and I can get them to squirm up and make it a little shorter. And then since I want these split tails, I'm going to take, sometimes I can do it with my finger, sometimes I can do it with the point of my scissors, but I'm just going to go in the middle of the clump and kind of convince some of them to go slightly one way and some the other. And I'm not looking for a perfect V on a pheasant tail, but I'm looking for some spread uh, so that it's not coming off in a uh, just a bundle of fibers off the back. Rotate your vise so they can see. You can see how that's flared out a little better. Okay. At the back, this is our back right here. All I did was get my finger in there and kind of roll it back and forth. Sometimes you can get the fibers to sit on the sides a little better and actually have a, a nicer split. This pattern, it really doesn't matter. This is pretty close to the traditional. So a few wraps to get my pheasant tail tied in, and then I'm going to cut off the remainder of this pheasant tail. Next thing we want is a wire rib. We're going to tie that in the same as we had then. Quick pinch wrap. Now, I'll talk about thread management again. Right? When I learned to tie, everything was tied in from the very back. Right, so we tie in the pheasant tail, and then they taught us wrap back to the back part, tie in your wire, tie it down, wrap back to the back part, tie in your next material. So you're 
you end up with this really crazy shape at the back. So if I'm doing multiple materials like this, right, I tie in my pheasant tail and I work towards the front. Now I know I have to tie in a wire. I'm going to tie the wire in right where my thread was and wrap to the back because I know I've got another material to go in. So I've just saved myself about three layers of thread on this back end. So I'll wrap that back to the back part and I can get rid of, cut off my last bit of wire. Now this, this fly is called the pheasant tail for a reason, right? It is almost all pheasant tail. So now for the body, I'm going to take a quite a bit larger clump. I don't know if it'll be enough, but it's fly tail. <laughs> There's two different ways you can do these pheasant tail bodies. That I'll, I'll explain them both and I'll show one. Uh, I'm tie these in by the tips. The reason I tie in by the tips is because they're a little bit thinner, so it keeps my bulk down. All right, first method. Uh, pheasant tail is I can grab the pheasant tail in my fingers, try to keep them even, wrap them around the hook up to where they're going to stop. In the beginning, that will give you some trouble. Pheasant tail tips are uh, pretty brittle, delicate. You'll, you'll break quite a few of them as you work with pheasant tail. So if you uh, have trouble with that, actually, I won't even show you now so I don't have to start this over. But I'll show you, we're gonna do the same thing with our bit of peacock. You can use the same technique that I show you for the peacock to reinforce your pheasant tail if you're having breakage issues. Sometimes some tails are, are more delicate than others. Um, but using one of the two methods, you'll be able to get it tied in. Now, I've got to build, I've got to build a body and a thorax for this fly. So the body of, the, of a mayfly nymph is relatively thin and tapered, and then we have a large thorax. Right, so I want the body to come up to about right here, remembering that this bead is not part of my fly. So I've got to do, leave room for my thorax and tying the fly off of here. So I'm going to take these pheasant tail fibers. It's easier for me if I clamp them in a set of hackle pliers than trying to manhandle them finger to finger. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just grooming them. I want them all to be exactly the same length. I take them straight up and I just clamp them with my pliers like this. I'm going to wrap the whole bundle, watching that hook point very carefully because it'll cut these easier than thread. If they start spreading out, just give your hackle plier a little twist. And you can turn them into a finer bundle. You'll see I already lost a couple out of the pliers here. So. And I'm just going to spiral this. And a nice close spirals until I get it to where I'm going to put in that point case. Okay. Get it there and I'll get a securing wrap. Two or three wraps to tie it in. You notice I'm up to, I've used all of the good looking part of that pheasant tail and now I'm down to the, the rough section that was by the stem, so I'll cut those off and take my wire, wrap it forward. Now if I'm using if I'm using wire for any reason that's for reinforcement, I always go backwards to whatever <coughs> direction the previous layer went. So it'll sit up on top and actually bind those in place. If 
I go the same direction, it'll have a tendency to want to just fall between the different wraps. Um, you'll see flies tied both ways. Sometimes the wire is there for more for visual, right? Like the midges we just did. Can, we're not going to reinforce that thread any better than than it already is, so we can wrap that one either way. But on the special tail, I'm going to go backwards. Number of wraps is depending a lot, dependent a lot of times on just the size of the fly you're doing. I think I got four wraps in this one. Tied it off exactly where I tied off my pheasant tail stems. Now, since this fly is called the pheasant tail, we're going to get some more pheasant, pheasant tail. Hey. We're gonna, now we're going to do a little wing case. So same thing, I'm going to grab six or eight strands. I want them evened up just like before because when they're done, these tips, if I do everything correctly, proportionally, these tips will be part of the fly rather than trimmed off. So I want them to be as even as I can. Now, same thing, I'm going to go about a shank length. Tie that in, same exact spot. And if, I, if I realize I'm crowding the head a little bit, when I do that pinch wrap, I can always tie these in towards the back rather than how we've been teaching in every other material, tying them in towards the front, away from the, away from the uh, bend of the hook. Something like a wing case is real easy. I can just tie that in, and if, if it looks like I'm crowding myself, I can tie it backwards and compress everything behind it, which I just did here. Now, you'll notice a lot of patterns have things we call wings. Well, we just tied a wing. Except we're gonna turn this one into a wing case. So now that that's tied in, I'm gonna take, cut the butts off again and we're going to tie in our thorax material which in this case is going to be peacock tail. So I'm just going to grab three or four of these strands. And the, the closer you get to the tip the more delicate these are although they are delicate from end to end. So I'm going to just tie these in somewhat close to the tip but I'm not overly worried about how close three or four securing wraps there and I can trim, trim the waist off. Now here's the trick. Like I said, you can use this on the pheasant tail if you find you're having difficulty. Is I am going to do a dubbing loop, just like we did last week with our hairs here, or our, our dubbing on some of the streamers. Pull the loop and I want to go right back to exactly the same spot the thread left the hook. And I'll spiral it forward to where I want it to end. Take this loop and run my peacock strands up it. And I want, same thing, I want to groom it so they're all exactly the same length. If somebody is short and I start twisting this up, it's gonna it'll break before before you even start wrapping it on the hook. So you want them as close to the same length as possible. I'm going to clamp the top with my hackle pliers and being careful not to put too much pressure on everything. I'm going to give it a half a dozen twists and you'll notice I just made peacock yarn. Much, much more durable than trying to work with the individual strands. So now I'm going to take that and I'm just going to wrap my body on this one. It looks like it'll probably be about three wraps to give it cover, two and a half ish. And I will tie that off like everything else and get my pliers out of the way. So Got it tied off so it can't run away on me, but now I want one or two more tighter wraps to secure it so when I cut it, they won't just slip out from under the threads. And I know I've talked to a couple people about how adding extra tension on your bobbin, right? We don't want our bobbin thread too tight. 
fact, here's the rule of thumb that I just remembered. The way I was taught was to set the tension of your bottom, right? Start your thread like you're going to do an under wrap, four or five wraps, so it's nice and secure on the hook. You should be able to take that thread and pull straight down. The thread should feed through your bottom. If it bends the hook, it's too tight. Does that make sense? Or if it takes the hook in the vise and twists it between the jaws, it's too tight. Uh, so when I went around this time, those last couple securing wraps, the, the part you don't see is I tightened up the grip in my hand so the spool wasn't moving or was dragging slower so I could get nice tight wraps on that so it's tight and real good. And then I'll just cut this off. All right, we're almost done with this. We're going to lay the wing case over, which is my little tips here. Same thing, you'll usually want to go through and do a little bit of grooming to get it to lay right before you try to tie it down. Make sure it's going to lay about where you want it to. And then you've got to do a pinch wrap, just like we were doing before, except you're going to be, your hands are swapping for this step. You're going to have to use the bottom with your left hand. The right hand is going to hold this wing case over. So I'll pull that over, and I've only got to get one, maybe two wraps around it just to hold it. Just trying to hold it in place. See how that laid forward? Now I'm going to grab my bobbin and put a little more tension on and do a couple of actual securing wraps. And now these tips, we're going to turn into legs. Little wigglies on the side. Which is why I with the pheasant tail, you really, you know, if you can, you want to try to experiment with the length when you tie the wing case in so you don't have to cut these off and then tie in a new bunch as legs themselves. So now I'm going to groom these backwards, just like I did going forwards, and then see I'm wiggling my finger around like we did on the tail. Mm -hmm. I want half of them to go to one side predominantly and half to go to the other side. And then a couple wraps to kind of hold them in position. Right, so they're leaning back, but they're not tied down well. So now that I've gotten the way I want them to go, I can go and start wrapping back over them just a couple of turns. And you see now they're tied down and facing backwards. It's a bead head. So this bead is still loose. You can see that moving around. I could have actually brought my, my body up slightly closer, but with a bead head, we can sit there and we'll just start winding right at the back of the bead. It's going to fall inside that open section of the bead, kind of piling up off itself towards the inside. Once, once the bead isn't rattling, we're good to go, we can tie off at any time. So with practice, you'll find that um, you'll be able to decrease this gap between the body and the bead. That's probably one of the bigger proportional places people have trouble with on a bead head.